Part 1 You will hear a telephone conversation between the receptionist at a college and a woman who wants to take a course at the college. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, Hembridge College. Can I help you? Hello. I saw a jewellery making course on your website that interests me, but I wasn't able to sign up for it online. I got a message telling me to phone this number, so can you tell me if there are any places left on the course? Yes, no problem. Do you know the course code by any chance? Yes, I wrote it down. It's JM1309. JM1309. Ah, yes. That's the jewellery making course on Thursday evenings from 6.30 until 8.30pm. That's the one. Hmm. I'm afraid there aren't any places left on that course. It's fully booked. Oh, dear. I suspected that might be the case. There's another jewellery making course on Tuesdays, JM1308. Oh, is there? Yes, from 10am until midday. Oh, that's no good. I work then. I'm only available in the evenings. That's a shame. I'd really like to do a course. What about the Working with Glass course on Friday evenings? Are there any spaces on that? Sorry, which course? Working with Glass. The code is GL1378. Ah, yes, Fridays from 6.15 until 8.45pm. That's the one. Are there any places on that? Let me see. Yes, we do have spaces. Excellent. So can I book that, please? Sure. Uh, can I take your name? Yes, it's Mrs. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. So I've entered your details. Will you be coming to your classes by car? Yes. Where would be the best place to park? Well, car parks C and D are both located next to the teaching buildings, but car park C is slightly closer to where you will be. OK, thanks. And how do I get to my classroom from there? You need to find the Cromer building first. It's just past the big red Harper building, which you will see immediately opposite you as you enter the car park. Once you're inside the building, go to the second floor and look for room 316. OK, great, thanks. And who will the teacher be? My friend mentioned a Mrs Halliday and said she was excellent, though that was some years ago and she may have retired by now. Actually, she's still working here, but she teaches the intermediate course. You'll be taking the starter course, and the teacher for that is Mrs Coley. She has written a book about glassmaking, so there's nobody better suited to introducing the subject. Oh, good. It sounds like I've chosen the right course. Oh, one other thing. Yes? Is there any kind of assessment? Will we get a certificate or anything when we finish the course? Yes, you'll get a certificate if you attend at least 50% of the classes. There is also a final project which will take place over the last three classes, but there is no formal assessment based on the work you do as part of it, and you get to take the pieces you've created home with you at the end of the course. OK, that's perfect. I don't want to have to take it all too seriously. So that just leaves the question of payment. You can pay for the whole course in one upfront payment, or you can pay on a lesson-by-lesson -lesson basis. If you pay up front, you'll get a reduction of 10% on the total price. Ah, OK. Well, unfortunately, my salary won't be in my bank account until next week, so I'll go for the pay-as-you-go option. Sorry, I didn't make myself clear. 
you don't need to pay for it all today. You can still get the 10% reduction if you pay when you come for the first class if you prefer. Perfect. I'll do that then. Fine. I've made a note of that. That is the end of part one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2 You will hear a tour guide giving an introductory talk to some visitors to a theme park. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good afternoon, ladies, gentlemen and children, and welcome to Prehistoric Park. Before you explore the place for yourselves, I'll let you know a little about what we have here and where you can find it. If you open your maps, you'll see we are currently at the ticket office. Once we get into the park, it's just a short walk over the bridge to the visitor centre. Here you can find more detailed information about the park and, of course, learn about dinosaurs and the world in which they lived. Connected to the visitor centre is the Fossil Museum, where you can observe several fossils and bones, including those brought from the famous local dig. From this room, you will also get a splendid panoramic view across the treetop walk over to the biodomes, where you can experience a recreation of the Mesozoic era, the age of the dinosaurs. Returning to the visitor centre, there are three possible routes to take around the park. The first leads from the visitor centre towards the northwest part of the park, in which you can find attractions for younger visitors. Before reaching the pterodactyl roller coaster, you will first pass the adventure playground on the left and the excavation pit, which was the original inspiration for the park, on the right. The second path leads directly from the visitor centre to the biodomes, and the third route heads towards the river, where you will find our lakeside cafe and island play den for the very youngest visitors. You can take paths from the Fossil Museum, Cafe and Biodomes to the Riverside Walk in the very east of the park. Here, boardwalks and bridges weave over a network of streams and lead to the car park via the gift shop. Before you get there, though, your route leads you across a small island with a tranquil picnic site. And I must say, the weather looks perfect for a picnic today. Now, does anybody have any questions? Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 15 to 20. Now, I'll just mention a few points that visitors often ask about. Let's start with ticket prices. Tickets cover entry to all attractions in the park, including the rides, museum and biodome. Adults must pay £10 for entry and tickets for children cost £5 each, although admission is free for those under six. Finally, there is a concession ticket for students and those over 65, which costs the same as a child's ticket. If you're interested in making several trips to the park, we also offer a season pass for adult students and families. You must have proof of identity and a passport photo with you for this, though. Payments in the ticket office can be by cash or credit card, 
But it's very important that you make sure you have cash before you go to the cafe, as they do not yet have a magnetic card reader. You'll be happy to know that there's a cash machine you can use on the left as you enter the visitor centre. Now, as your kids no doubt already know, there is plenty here to keep them entertained. The pterodactyl is our most popular attraction with children, a roller coaster that is certain to get the adrenaline pumping. Bear in mind, though, that there is a 120 centimetre height requirement for this ride. In the same area of the park, there's also a crazy golf course with nine dinosaur-themed holes. You could win a dinosaur toy if you get a good score. Our ghost train, the Cretaceous Caverns, is also very popular, especially if you like a scare. It was closed for development until yesterday and is now even more petrifying. The treetop walk is a good choice for kids who like climbing, running and jumping and gives excellent views of the park. For younger visitors, I would recommend the Island Play Den next to the cafe, which has a ball pit and excellent supervision from our staff. And if you would like some family time, why not finish off by visiting the Riverside Walks picnic area? OK, any questions? No? Well, then I hope you enjoy your visit. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 3 You will hear three students discussing schemes for work placements abroad. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hey, Lisa, you went abroad as part of your social work course, didn't you? Yes, I did. I spent a year in South Africa the year before I graduated. It was a great experience. I'd like to do something similar. I've always wanted to spend some time overseas and do something useful while I'm there, not just be a tourist. It can be hard to find good placements, though. And often you have to pay a lot of money for the opportunity. It's not fair when education is already so expensive. And you're working, after all. Did you have to pay for your work experience, Lisa? No, I was lucky. I managed to get a place in a scheme called the Overseas Training Scheme, or OTS. That meant that I worked as a volunteer for the overseas organization, but the scheme paid for my flights and gave me a living wage while I was out there. That's ideal. How can I get on that scheme? Well, first you'd have to check that you're eligible. I don't think the scheme is open to people doing any subject. The OTS only offers places to people who are interested in working in the community. You know, like social work, nursing or education. Well, I study public health and nutrition. You'd probably be eligible then, Sarah. I don't know about you though, George. Mechanics doesn't really fall into that category. No, I don't think so. So, what would I need to do? You have to complete an application form, which you can download from the OTS website. And then you have to get a member of the college staff to verify that you're a student here and write you a reference. Who did you get to do that? My personal tutor. I'm sure your tutor would help you out with it, Sarah. OK. And how soon after you send the application do you know whether you're successful? Oh, not for ages. There's a long selection process. They choose a load of candidates, and if you're one of the ones shortlisted, you'll be invited to attend an interview. Oh, I didn't realise there was such competition for places. Yes, it's tough. Only a small percentage of applicants are successful. It hardly seems worth the bother. That's a bit pessimistic, George. I think it's definitely worth a try. If the OTS can arrange a placement for you and pay you to do it, then... 
Well, they don't find the placement for you. Don't they? No, you have to do that yourself. You have to contact organisations that interest you and find a placement that suits your skills. Don't worry about that, though. The college can help you. It didn't take me long to find my placement in South Africa. Once you've got confirmation of that, the OTS will book your flight. It sounds great. I really want to try it. Well, don't set your hopes on it. As I said, places are highly sought after and you can't guarantee you'll get one. You'll have to keep an eye open for alternative options. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 26 to 30. What about you, George? Have you got any ideas about where you can get a work placement? Well, there's the exploration scheme. Oh, yes, I heard about that. I've never heard of it. I don't think you'd be eligible for it, Sarah. It's designed for people who work in industry or construction. That sounds right up your street, George. Well, I've been looking into it. And it looks okay at first glance. But I have some reservations. The application process is simple, and there are loads of options to choose from, but... Oh, so there's no competition for places at all? I think it's first come, first served. The earlier you apply, the more likely you are to get on the program you like. It's not like the OTS. You're pretty much guaranteed a placement. So, what's the problem then? Well, all the placements are in Europe. I really want to go to the USA or Canada. Even so, there are some great places in Europe. Yeah, but I'm hopeless at languages. All the more reason why you should go. It's important to learn other languages. Where did the overseas training scheme allow you to travel, Lisa? Anywhere in the world. That's lucky. The programs on the exploration scheme aren't all work programs, are they, George? Some of them involve work and study. Yes, but I'm not interested in those placements. I'm not surprised. Studying in another language now, that would be hard. I think the study courses are all in English, actually. So that's not the reason I'm not interested. I just want a break from studying. I'm sick of all the tests and assignments. I feel as if I've been doing them all my life. Well, the work placements sound ideal then. I suppose so. But the real problem is money. Aren't the work placements paid? A few are, but most aren't. And you definitely don't get things like accommodation and flights paid for like you do on the OTS scheme. I think you should still try for it though, George. It'd be a great experience for you, and it'll probably help you to get a job in the future. You're bound to be able to get a loan from the bank to cover those costs. Maybe, but I'm still going to keep an eye out for other options. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4. You will hear the start of a lecture about architecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. Today we're going to start our series of lectures on designing buildings in relation to the climate. An important term in this context is passive design. 
Passive design refers to the way buildings are designed to ensure thermal comfort for occupants within the building, with minimal use of heating or cooling equipment. It's said that about 40% of household energy use goes into heating or cooling the air in order to maintain a comfortable temperature. Obviously, with increasing energy insecurity, there is more and more pressure to reduce this figure. And with sensitive and intelligent passive design, we could easily decrease this percentage to 20% in the short term and, it is hoped, eventually eliminate it altogether. In the past few decades, one of the main driving forces behind architectural design has been, I'm sorry to say, affordability. In other words, cheap houses made with cheap materials in basic designs. The reduction in construction cost has been passed on to the occupiers, who can then buy or rent their property without it costing them the earth. But lately, there has been a shift towards a greater upfront cost, balanced out by lower operational costs. That is to say, the building may cost more to build, buy or rent, but it will cost less to maintain it at a comfortable temperature. In terms of thermal comfort, humans are notoriously hard to please. Humans are sensitive not only to temperature, but also humidity, air movement, and exposure to heat sources or cool surfaces. Get any of these wrong, and humans will instinctively reach for some sort of appliance to make themselves more comfortable. What's more, human thermal comfort is both physical and psychological. I'm sure you've all noticed that we often feel uncomfortable even if the room is a perfectly good temperature, if we're, say, sitting in a draft or next to a cold window. And although we can design buildings with a very good physical thermal comfort using software modeling techniques, psychological comfort is much more difficult to get right. Accordingly, architects and designers have been looking to traditional solutions to these problems that can be found in different architectural traditions. Before the lecture continues, you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 36 to 40. Now I've given you this brief introduction into passive design, I want to look specifically at designing for a hot, arid climate, such as that found in the Middle East. Now, designing for climate is not a new thing. Take a look at this slide, for example. Here, in this picture, you can see a domed building typical of mosques and also many domestic buildings in such climates. Domes are particularly effective because they expose a larger surface area to the sky than a flat roof. As a result, heat that builds up during the day can radiate out at night, so by morning the building is cool again. Also during the day, a smaller area is exposed to the sun when it's directly overhead thus minimizing heat absorption at the hottest part of the day. Another feature of Islamic buildings is the louvered door, these beautiful, ornate, lace-like screens that you can see here. These not only reduce glare from the sun, but they also allow ventilation by enabling breezes to waft through walls. Added to this is the courtyard, another feature which helps to provide a cool environment. Courtyards remain cool because hot air warmed by the sun rises and is replaced by cooler air from the ground. A water feature in the centre, such as a pool or fountain, can produce further cooling through the process of evaporation, while the addition of vegetation, a palm tree for example, can provide shade and increase air movement. 
This cool air that builds up in the courtyard then gets drawn into the home via the louvered doors and windows that I've just mentioned. And this helps to keep the rooms cool and well ventilated. Then, by having high windows on the outside of the building, we can encourage any hot air that builds up indoors to escape as it rises. Obviously, as the population moves into cities, we can't build these beautiful courtyard residences for everyone. There isn't the space, and people can't always afford them. So, we need to integrate technologies which can improve thermal comfort into multi-residency city buildings. Let's look now at some of the ways this can be done. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.